Thinking about defining hope, it's that the desire to really make a choice to believe that things can be better, that people can be good, that hope is not a useless act, like hope is in itself something that can, can positively channel. And so even the act of hope, I think, is an important one. I think through being hopeful, you are opening up positive opportunities in the future that may not otherwise be there. My name's Gemma Mortensen. I'm a lifelong activist and campaigner, and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. Hi, Gemma. How are you? Hi, Chris. I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. It's pronounced Gemma. Am I right? Uh, Gemma, soft G. Gemma, okay, yeah. that's even prettier. That's better, that's great. And Mortensen? Yeah, got it perfectly. Super cool. You've had a busy day, it sounds like. Yes, I'm so, yeah, the last few weeks have been unbelievably busy. It's just one of those um, periods of time where there's lots of kind of, you know, good change, but it kind of sucks sucks you in and doesn't leave you much time for other <laughs> stuff. So I'm, I apologies, we, apologies we had to reschedule. <laughs> no problem at all, not at all. So if I get this right, let me just make sure. I'm going to, I'm going to read this bio because this is impressive. It really is. You've done a lot of work. And you're not even 80 years old yet, right? I mean, sometimes I talk to people, I'm like, you've got to be 150 because there's no way you can do all this. <laughs> really? So you joined change.org in January of 2016. So this year, correct? Yeah. Okay, very cool. So before that, and you're, you're doing general, you're over the whole thing globally. Is that right too? Uh, yeah, so I um, run the general management team, which is like a, all the teams globally. Yeah, but not oh, the wow. not the tech side. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna dive into change.org here in a minute. For anybody who doesn't know, that is a crazy, amazing organization that is just fun to read through. Even if you're not, even if you're not starting something on your own, just reading through it will amaze you how much people are getting done by just bringing awareness. But before change.org, you were previously the executive director of Crisis Action. And you joined them in 2006, kind of early on, like you were one of the first two staff members. You led the organization to receive the 2012 MacArthur Award for Creative and Effective Institutions. Then in 2013, the Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship, near and dear to my heart right there. 2011, the World Economic Forum selected you as one of their young global leaders. CNN named you as one of their inspirational women for 2014. And you became a Yale World Fellow in 2015. You previously worked for the permanent mission of the United Kingdom to the United Nations in New York, the European Commission, and you've been a journalist. Just been doing nothing for so long. I can't believe it. <laughs> it's like crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's been busy, but a busy life is a good life. Yeah. yeah. Do you sleep sometimes? Maybe? Um, yeah, you know, that's one thing that um, I've got more conscious and conscientious about. I think I've got young kids. So um, I see you, you've you got five kids. Is that right? I do. Yeah. They're not young though anymore. They're nine to 15. I guess that's still young. But yeah, they're, they're not uh, they're not waking me up in the middle of the night anymore. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. So you, 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 the, the sleep becomes about as precious a commodity as life can give you, I think, at a, at a certain point in your life. And um, yes, let's say when I get it, I savor it. And yeah. the rest it's a it's a wonderful thing it is it is truly all right so change.org for those out there either watching or listening who don't know what change.org is you need to just look it up change.org this is a place where you can start a petition to bring public attention to anything imaginable and some of the things that have been going on here at change.org are amazing you can start a petition really easily you, you can read all about it there but listen to some of the successes recently so I'm hitting their website today. It is, to make sure I get the date right here, it is the 26th of July, 2016. And on the front page, mom stands up to protect anti-bullying laws. There's President Obama grants clemency to a woman serving a life sentence. Congress passes landmark disability rights bill. Whole Foods takes major step on food waste. Now, all these things are because change.org is bringing awareness uh, to, to just a, a, an enormous array, a very broad array of issues around the world. These are, those are some American ones. There's stuff all over the world. How in the world, Jim, do you actually manage 
all these things on so many different genres. It's not like y'all are genre specific. Yeah, no, we're not. And and actually, one of the things is that, um, you know, it's not something that we have to manage in that way. So hmm. one of the beauties of Change.org is that it's a platform that enables ordinary people to initiate and take action. Hmm. And um, many of the examples that you just referenced there are examples of ordinary people who may never have done campaigning before in their lives. Some, some have, some have not. Um, and something has happened in their life which motivates them to decide to stand up um, to decide to do something about it and to believe that there are enough people out there that would wish to support them in in their attempt to make things better um, and one of the reasons why I was um, keen to do this um, have this conversation with you was because I think that is a deeply hopeful act um, if you decide to um, not just rest but to um, act on something that is painful or difficult or, or, or angers you you are choosing, you know, hope over apathy and, um, you know, despair, despondency. And um, that's a very, very important thing. And I think something that fuels millions of people around the world to use the platform. Mm. That's beautiful. That is, really is cool. All right. Well, Jim and Mortensen, you probably know how this works. We're interviewing a thousand people from around the world like you who are leading in some amazing way in the realm of hope like you're doing. And you've been doing for years now in so many great places. So thanks for your time, first of all. I know you're crazy busy. And um, we want to ask you our five questions that we ask each of these global leaders. And you answer them your way. This is all about you, not about me or anybody else. And um, we'd love to hear and learn from you about hope. You ready for this? Sure thing. Okay. So question one, how do you define hope? What's your, like, your favorite definition or your favorite quote about hope? Yeah, so I mean, if thinking about defining hope, it's that funny sensation, isn't it, of a almost like a desire and expectation for something. But if I think about what hope stands for, it's far more than that, I think. There's a symbolic value that it has for me, which is as motivational as it is, you know, a, a kind of concrete meaning. And that is, as I just said around the platform, it's a desire to to really make a choice to believe that things can be better, that people can be good, that um, hope is not uh, a useless act. Like hope is in itself something that can po that can positively channel um, whether it's the desire for oneself or one's community to make things better. Um, and so even the act of hope, I think, is an important one. Um, I think through being hopeful, um, you are opening up positive like positive opportunities in the future that may not otherwise be there. Um, and then in terms of, you know, there's so many wonderful quotations on hope, but mm. I'll choose for you the one, you know, it's a recent one for me. It's a, a sad one in many ways, but um, I was uh, good friends with uh, the Labour MP in the UK, Joe Cox, who was murdered very sadly um, mm. a few weeks ago. And... Um, she was an incredible woman, um, a very hopeful woman, um, somebody who always believed in the best in people and was always um, just unerringly hopeful about about life. Um, and her one of the quotes that's become you know famous of her since her death was this idea that, um, as she said, you know we have more in common than that which divides us. And I think if you look around the world today and you look at so many, you know quite desperate things that have happened recently, whether um, shootings in Orlando or, um, you know, the coup d'etat in Turkey or the terrible atrocities in Nice, um, the sad shootings in Munich, um, you know, the terrible bombings in Baghdad, um, the violence that's um, ensuing again in Kashmir. Like, it's very easy to take a look at the world and to believe that the ruptures between us um, based on, you know, whatever dividing lines there are, are impossible to overcome. And what Joe stood for, and I think what we experienced in the aftermath of her death is, um, you know, thousands of people came together to say that they wanted to live a life of hope, a live a life of goodness, um, is that indeed, you know, we do have more in common than that which divides us. And it's a, a very, very, very important principle of humanity, I think, and can too easily get lost in um, what can be a very kind of polarized experience of life um, in the present days. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry for your loss too. I know, I know you guys on that side of the island or that side of the, the Atlantic have had a, a different um, taste of what that's like. So I'm sorry for you. 
Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's an experience that is touching um, almost everyone in every country around the world in different ways at the moment in terms of the dangers of polarised politics. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's up to, um, you know, so many of us to make sure that um, the efforts that we pursue um, go towards, you know, mending the divisions within society, which can be very locally, you know, at a very, very local level, not necessarily, it doesn't have to be big societal change, mm -hmm. um, but that we can all do our part to making sure that we live in a way that is understanding and tolerant and harmonious. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, on that then, building on that, who has shared the most hope with you in your life so far? Well, I think there's, yeah, like two, um, two kind of aspects to look at this, really. Um, one is a continuation of the story I, I just told, and the other is a very different one based on, you know, uh, motherhood, really. But... Um, in the wake of Joe's death, um, it could have been easy for everybody to um, become very maudlin and, and despondent about the, the reason that she died. Um, instead, what erupted was an unbelievably hopeful and positive reaction led by the enormous dignity of her husband, Brendan, who um, managed to have the wherewithal and emotional uh, composition I don't know how he did it to basically say that the most important thing that Joe would have wanted would be to um, fight the hatred that killed her and um, what came through was um, hundreds and hundreds of messages um, from across the world of uh, people who said that they wanted to choose love over hate you know hope over hope over darkness and that as an experience to see how many people felt like that um, and how many people would stand up for um, the goodness in humanity was um, deeply, deeply inspiring to me um, personally and to all those of us who were helping really just put ourselves at the service of channeling some of that. Um, I also have the uh, great fortune and privilege to uh, work in a company in which um, people spread um, and initiate stories of hope on a daily basis. And every time I connect to one of those stories, um, it, it's, it's honestly like a life source. It's so unbelievably invigorating and inspiring. Um, you mentioned a few of them at the, at the beginning of the call, but, you know, we have 14, a 14-year-old 14 girl recently in the UK who managed to convince some of the biggest supermarkets um, to uh, abandon... Um, caged eggs so chickens you know raised in captivity and, and eggs produced in that way because she owned chickens and she saw um what that did to them and what freedom meant to them you know a 14 year old girl took on took on these big supermarkets similarly you know you had a a young woman um of a of a similar age well early 20s in india who was sexually assaulted on a bus um and she could have um you know let that let that go but she didn't she she wrote to the company she got some automated reply she wrote again she got the same cold kind of dismissive response from them um and she st started a petition she got um many many um supporters who also believed as she did that this was something that couldn't be ignored that it was important what she was um raising and eventually as a result of this and and the support that she had she was able to meet the ceo of the company and um the recommendations and demands that she was making about um how to deal with instances like that were were met and and you know that was changed um wow. these are these are they, these in some ways seem seem like you know it's not about um changing the face of geopolitics but it's about individuals who show that if you decide to take a stand um you know hope can win out like if you hope if you invest in that belief that by standing up, you know, it is possible um, that something is done, then there are just so many, so many people around the world of, of all ages that are showing us um, what's possible. Another story I love recently was um, a community in Thailand who had been protesting for some time actually around um, a company involved in gold extraction. And um, as with many extractive industries, you know, there can be some incredibly serious side effects, health side effects that take place around that. And um, many of their um, protests have, had fell, fallen on deaf ears. Um, but through the use of, um, you know, modern technology, not just change.org, but a number, a number of um, platforms and social media, um, including Line and others, um, they were able to scale up um, the support that they had to get their voice out in, in a way that hadn't been heard. And again, you know, we're able to take demands that um, 
uh, were so important to their community and have a direct conversation with um, the company in that case um, and the government, um, who in this case it was actually the government who decided to take action to suspend um, operations so that they could actually look into and address these health concerns. And what I what I love about seeing um, you know the most inspiring stories on the platform is that it's not just individuals who um, see that they can make a difference, but it's actually decision makers, whether they're people in government or local government or in companies who understand that actually they're able to be so much more effective and they're able to do so much more good to the world if they put themselves in a position of responsiveness to these amazing, you know, citizens really who have taken the initiative to demonstrate, you know, what can be improved on behalf of their communities and, and for others. So um, channeling that kind of hope and inspiration is, as I say, a, a huge, huge privilege. And um, it's really the role of um, all the people that work in Change.org to put ourselves at the service of, of people like them. Um, that's what we're here to do. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great stories. Great stories. So tell me about you. So question three is, when's a time in your life when you've needed this kind of hope to get you through something difficult? You seem like you're on top of the world right now. Does it Has it ever not been on top of the world? And what did you do about it? Yeah, no, sure. I mean, um, you know, there's a, uh, I think if you live a life in which you're prepared to make um, bold choices, you know, whether that's going and um, living abroad and not knowing, you know, as a young person, not knowing what awaits you or taking a job that seems like a big risk at the time, or, um, you know, if you're prepared to throw yourself um, to the, um, yeah, to, you know, to the wind of hope in many ways and, and do the right thing, um, then it's very, very important that you believe that the values on which you live your life um, and the principles that you hold dear to your heart um, are going to be the ones that um, prevail in the end and that isn't an objective um, rational decision often that is has to be based in a core belief that um, if you you know give the right thing to the world then you will be a very lucky recipient of wonderful people doing wonderful things in return mm -hmm. um, and um, I think uh, yeah, it's. Um, I would say I'm a, I'm a deeply hopeful, optimistic person, but um, I think the um, you know the, the the road of good intentions is a long one, and it's not enough just to be hopeful. And um, I've been lucky enough to work with some of the you know best activists in the world, and I think um, what they possess actually is a combination of, in some ways, utter ruthlessness, um, the ability to see um, the black and white kind of colors of harsh reality and to imagine from that a viable and realistic path to a more hopeful place because willing things into being isn't enough and I think you have to have a combination of the imagination and the aspiration and the um, genuine commitment to um, a better world full of you know good people doing good things but um, though it may be hope that holds you aloft and, and guides you forward and pushes you along, that has to be matched with a real rigour about looking at seriously about what it takes to make social change because it, it's not an easy road and it takes many, many people working together. Um, the, the great victories of Change.org are the victories of many individuals and organisations and, you know, the journalists who covered the story and the decision maker who chooses to do something about it. This is true collective action and true collective effort. And I think one of the things um, that is so important about um, working in social change is that um, not only are you hopeful, but that you have a sense of generosity um, towards people and recognition of how any contribution you make or you make from the vantage point of the company or organization that you're in is only a part of the solution, is only a part of the progress made and that um, it's very, very much um, a uh, an act of kind of common understanding and endeavor. And I think if you work from that vantage point, um, then you really are, you know, it really is possible to be, um, to to have sustained hope and, and not just to have hope that um, is, is illusory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well said. Well said. You, you've, you've done so much. You've seen so much. How are you, let's just go question four. How are you actually sharing hope today? Now, I, I know your official capacity at change.org, and obviously that's far reaching. But apart from just generally what change.org does as an organization, what do you do on a daily basis or 
kind of generally in your life throughout the past few months, years, whatever, to, to really share hope with other people? How do you personally do that? Um, so I think, um, I think in some ways that the world has become a place where being hopeful is um, slightly scorned um, insofar as, you know, we live in a place where there is um, a huge degree of information to digest, uh, the world moves at a very fast pace. Um, and I think it's, it's very, very important actually to give people the space and license to hope. Um, and what I mean by that is a number of things. Um, dreaming without design is, is, is useless. But being able to imagine, being able to visualize, being able to understand what a better future, whether that's, you know, your kid doing better at school or your relationship being better or what you're achieving through work being better is a, is a very profoundly important thing. And I think it takes, um, it takes a, support actually it takes people helping each other to remain hopeful to keep casting their eyes to that which is positive and that which is um exciting and and pleasurable about the future and i think what i try and do and sometimes i hope succeed and sometimes no doubt um miserably fail is create a context in which being hopeful is a daily part of life um, and is something that is celebrated and something that is um, really cherished. Um, and I, I, I think that's, you know, I see that very much with my kids that um, just fostering within them that, you know, innocent hopefulness about whether it's about nature or about the way that they're seeing the world or thinking about space or whatever it is, um, that sense of enormous possibility. And at work, I think just really giving people a belief in themselves because I think if you have a belief in yourself and in your own potential you are far more likely to not only be hopeful and positive and create good things yourself but you're far more likely to spread that to others and um, it needs to become contagious um, I think if if we get to a place where we're supporting each other to adopt that mindset um, as a predisposition then you have a situation in which you have a, a really wonderful virtuous circle in which people can support each other to be their best selves, but also to create the best that they can for others. Wow. Yeah, well done. Well said. Very inspiring too. So playing off that, then question five is real practical. What can I do right now? So we hang up this call and I've got to go out there and keep living my life apart from recording a podcast and what do I do to build hope in other people or build hope in myself? Like the simple ABCs. So I would say, um, you know, I think what you are doing is excellent. I think sharing hopeful stories is actually really, really important. And um, one of the things that, you know, I've said I I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely love um, through the work of Change.org is people who wouldn't otherwise get their stories shared, um, really being given a platform to show um how hopeful it is when you choose to take action. So for me, for me, it's a, an, it comes down to a couple of things. Like you can change people's emotional state by sharing with people the things that you think are hopeful. Um, it could be things in your life. It could be things that you think are um, going better rather than worse in the world. It could be showing people, you know, the, the many, many examples of everyday kindnesses that just reconnect you to the goodness of individual people. And again, to this, you know, going back to the quote at the beginning, like this sense that, you know, we have far more in common. It's so easy to get fixated on division and the things that we um, find frustrating in each other people, in each other. But, you know, what what is innate in our, our, in our human experience goes so deep and it's such a it's such a, a kind of bind a bond between us all um and so i think just exploring that and helping people celebrate that in each other and the, and the other thing is is agency um find your own agency um that may be choosing to set up a change dog or petition it might be setting up a community group um on something that you care passionately about um you will know what matters most to you in your life and it will be very, very different for, um, for very, very many people. And, and that's okay because out there in the world will be other people who feel exactly as you do and care about the things exactly as you do. Find them, um, help bring them together and help um, bring that to life because 
the experience of doing something about something that you care about with a people, a group of people who care about it too, mm -hmm. is one of the most beautiful, exhilarating, affirming experiences that life can ever give you and you will give other people. And I think that, you know, boils down to a sense of agency. Um, it's, it's something that's very, very, very important um, for human beings, I think. And, um, and if you have agency, I think you have hope. Oh, wonderful. Good advice. Good advice, Gemma. You're you're pretty good at this sharing hope thing. <laughs> Obviously. I've got a lot of hope to share. <laughs> you do. I'm so glad you do too. You've been sharing it with the world for so so many ways, so long. It's just great. So tell me this, when you're when you're kinda down and out and you're just like, ah, oh, it's been such a hard day and you know, some days, even though you're part of some amazing stories, you still feel the weight of the world on your shoulders. Do you yeah. listen to any special music? Is there some favorite band or song out there or a movie you watch or a book you read? What kind of gets you fired back up again? Yeah, good. Yeah. So two things, um, three things. Mm -hmm. um, one, I love nature. So um, for me, like the, the fastest way for me to get back to a place of um, just, you know, aren't I lucky? The world is amazing. However hard a day has been, you know, shut up and focus on you know, like how lucky you are thing, is walking through a beautiful field or woodland or seeing a beautiful view or just seeing just you know something that's profoundly simple but beautiful in nature I think it gives you perspective and it helps you channel something which is far more profound a sense of perspective than daily life often gives you um the second thing is absolutely music um I'm lucky enough to live um with my husband who uh, is a very, very brilliant curator of music, whether that's um, wonderful, um, wonderful jazz, whether it's, um, you know, beautiful, transcendent kind of mournful uh, music, whether it's the kinds of things that at a younger time in our life, I wish I did it more, you know, we'd go out dancing to. That is absolutely, I love dancing around the kitchen with my kids. I mean, something that just enables you to tap into something that's, you know, quite primal and, and, and liberated and, um, just really enables you to be joyful um, is is very 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 important and you know linked to that obviously is just family I think um, there is something so um, so just so simple but so uh, so beautiful about um, going back to the source of you know life and um, your life and your family and um, that is such a wellspring of energy and of motivation and of responsibility a feeling of um, really having to just even if it feels tough sometimes pick yourself back up and go and do every day you know put your service of at making the world a better place not just for your children but for um, everyone else's children and generations after them um, and I think that's um, again it's just a, a, a very wonderful sense of perspective that you get from thinking not about your own life but your your existence within a far longer kind of timeline of, of humanity in a way and 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 the privilege that we have to experience a small part of it. it it truly is a gift nature jazz and family <laughs> the secret sauce right there yep it gives food <laughs> <laughs> i love it okay well Gemma, you've been just a privilege to talk to and and before we let you go i want to know where to find out more about you so change.org are there social media accounts that we should be following where, where do you want people to go to learn about Gemma? Yeah, so I think don't learn about me, learn about the wonderful people using the platform, um, because I think they will be far more inspiring in many ways. It's it's people who, as I said, haven't necessarily done anything before and have chosen to, um, uh, like, cross the line and, and, and start start uh, discovering the magic, the wonders of, of campaigning. So um, follow Change.org on Twitter, um, at Change. Um, you can follow me at Gemma Mortensen, um, but I'm not... Um, I'm definitely not the most uh, uh, regular uh, tweeter. Um, and um, otherwise, yeah, I think the best way to connect with me really is through whatever work I'm supporting at the time. And um, and the, the place really where I think um, we'll just see the most wonderful, wonderful unlocking of, of energy all around the world. We need to get better at um, creating a, a Twitter account for Change.org that really, I think... Um, curates um all of the most wonderful campaigns from across the globe um and so we'll be doing that in the in the next um few weeks and months and i really hope it becomes um a source of some of the most inspiring stories out there in the world about people um choosing to make a difference so go there okay 
I have no doubt that it'll become one of the most inspiring places for that kind of a story. It's you, you're already doing it. Nice work. Very nice work. So next time you're in the Americas, let me know. Uh, we'd love to host you. I'm in Memphis, Tennessee right now, but love to say oh, hi and yeah, let you meet some people here. So before we go, Gemma, say your name and I share hope or your name, your title or something about you. And I share hope. We put that little audio snippet at the beginning of the podcast. So yeah. we let you introduce yourself. My name's Gemma Mortensen. I'm a lifelong activist and campaigner, and I share hope. Beautiful. Beautiful. Gemma, thank Gemma. you so much for your time. I, I know it's valuable, and I can't thank you enough. And we, we're just going to have so much fun sharing this story. Yeah, thanks so much. The, um, I don't know how you're going to use the beginning bit, but I didn't know that we were, I don't, that, yeah, the bit where you were asking me questions at the beginning just about what I was doing. I, want, I didn't realize we were, <laughs> well, you can just cut any of the beginning bit out, just do it because it won't make much sense. <laughs> I promise I won't embarrass you. Don't worry about that. So typically the, uh, the podcast, we chop up a little bit. We try to be as authentic as possible and only take out, you know, if there's some big mistake or, or a dog barks or something like that in the background. But Otherwise, we try to be as authentic as possible because, you know, at the end of the day, um, for the YouTube audience and the podcast audio only audience, it's shared. I think we're in 70 something countries now. It's all over the place. I'm so thrilled. I mean, all we do is record it and put it out there. Other people, I don't know who, literally, I don't know who they take it and spread it. It's so cool that they that they're finding hope in it. But but people love the authenticity of it. You know, it's it. They love the lack of production and the the realness of real conversations and most of us are, you know, getting home from a crazy work day and have kids screaming in the background and all kind of crazy stuff. So I'm glad you're a normal person because it makes it attainable for the rest of us. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's no worries. The, um, just the, the bit at the beginning where I described my role, I yeah. just, I, it was just a bit flip. Like, I can't remember what I said, but maybe, I don't know if it's useful for me to just answer that question again. Yeah, so uh, we can absolutely do that. So I'll, I'll put some audio notes in here. We can put this at the beginning there. So tell me again, Gemma, what it is that you do on a daily basis with change.org and how you kind of got there. So my job title is Chief Global Officer, which sounds rather grand. Um, but actually, really what it means is that there are wonderful, wonderful campaigners working all over the world in, um, in many different countries. And um, my role is to look at how we build an organizational structure and how we run things really in a way that best supports them to be able to empower millions of people around the world to use the platform to affect social change. So um, a, a, uh, a fancy job title really um, is actually a... Yeah, it actually really symbolizes a, a role that I see as one of service, <laughs> service to many other people. Mm. That's a that's a big role. It sounds like the, the it sounds like a a role that should be in charge of all the heads of states of all the countries around the world, because they all talk about all this change they want to do. But I'm not sure as much of it happens that should happen. And and maybe you could be the boss of all of them and help them out. That'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> not sure they like that. Not sure. <laughs> Not sure I'd be up for it. Yeah. <laughs> Me either. Yeah, it's uh, it's a, I, it's one of my um, reflections on uh, American culture is that there's definitely a different culture of job titles on this side of the scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're you're actually doing something with your job title. I think that the doing is more important than the saying, and you're definitely a doer. And uh, and I'm thrilled to be talking to you today. I really am. Me too. All right, great work. Well. That about wraps it up for us. Um, and thank you. Uh, we'll put that at the beginning of the episode. We'll get all that right for you. I, it was a good explanation. I'm, I'm glad you corrected that. Yeah, thanks. It was just I hadn't, I hadn't clocked we were um, rolling. And it's like, that's not a good explanation. <laughs> you're, you're perfect, I promise. But we'll um, fix that little part for you. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I'm sorry again, it's taken a while for us to speak, but I'm really, really glad you're doing this. It's a fantastic thing and there needs to be far more of it. So if it's getting picked up all over the place, then it's very well deserved and keep on going. We will. Thanks, Gemma. Have a great evening or a great day. <laughs> you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time.